I think that a really good marker for people to think about when you think that you have this concept down is number one, if, you, if you're like, yeah, yeah, I understand something, anything really, but especially vulnerability, then that would be the moment to stop and pause and say, okay, wait a minute. That should tell me that I'm actually um, not getting curious in the moment about something that could be expansive for me. So the thing that I know about vulnerability is that it takes a tremendous amount of courage and emotional exposure, which never feels good to me. Okay. So when I know that I'm sweating in a meeting or I my heart is racing because I'm trying to say something that feels very hard for me to say, that is probably me practicing in real time. From seven CTOs, my name is Etienne De Bruyne and you're in the CTO studio. Hi all, welcome to another episode of the CTO Studio. I'm with Etienne De Bruin. You might know him. Some of you do, some of you don't. And I'm Brittany Cotton, the head of coaching at Seven CTOs. And very exciting. Today with us, we have an incredible coach, an incredible leader, the founder of C Suite Collective. And mm. What else would you like folks to know about you, Elena Armijo? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. You all are, are some beautiful leaders in the world, so I'm very excited to be here. And I have been living in Los Angeles now for a year and like three months, and I'm still undecided whether or not I love it, but it is growing on me every day that I don't have to be in winter in New York City anymore. My partner, Aaron, and I are, you know, he's in an entertainment full-time, so for his business, he wanted to come out here. And we had spent two years of the pandemic in New York and, you know, we're pretty well set up for 2020 and 2021. We had, you know, he already had a studio in home, so he didn't have to do anything to be online. My business has been online for eight years. And so I feel like as a couple, we really endured two years in the pandemic in New York. And then we just woke up one day and we're like, we don't need to do this anymore. We've thought about California for many years and it's time. It is now time. We have paid our dues. New York has changed. And we will be back, I'm sure. He grew up in New Jersey and is from that area. But we were ready for expansion, both of us. So we decided to make the big move. Very glad that you did, because that means I've gotten to see you more. And yeah. I realized that I want to actually speak a little bit more about who you are in the world and why it's so important for you to be on this podcast where we're going to talk about vulnerability. Elena, as I said, is the founder of the C-Suite Collective, and C-Suite is a vision of what, where, what did you see was missing in the world, and what did you want to bring to folks? One of the things I saw was missing that was highlighted over the last three years in real time with everything that we've all gone through was belonging and intimacy and vulnerability in cultures. And so we had all had this conversation with, you know, social unrest and racial inequity and a lot of things going on in our world that we were all dealing with, with organizations. And nobody was talking about a long-term plan to change culture from the inside out or to catalyze culture change. And so to me, as a coach in eight years, I've worked with a lot of leaders who have great ideas and would implement things here and there along the way, but there wasn't one place where you could come and really be in partnership with coaches and trainers and leaders to change culture from the inside out over a long period of time. So that's what that's why I created this. The vision is really that we give you more support than you've ever had and we give it with consistency and over time so that you can track your own data and see real results in changing belonging and diversity and equity and inclusion conversations. And for you, why the C-suite? Well, I have a strong belief that if you don't start at the top with people, the people that are in charge and leading, nothing changes. So in my work in eight years, I had worked with a lot of leaders that would bring me in to work with the middle of their company or young leaders that were not quite at the C-suite yet, but would be someday. And what we saw was happening in those conversations is a lot of them were quick fixes or ways to develop people to be in an old paradigm of leadership, which was still control or fear or uh, their way or the highway type thinking. And so I quickly learned in the first couple of years of being a coach that that was causing more harm than actually creating change in a conversation. 
So when I really took a step back, I said, okay, where do I want to have the most impact as a coach and a leader? And also, how can I create a company that will also have that impact? And I knew that I immediately wanted to start with the top. So now when companies come in and they ask us about working with us, the very first question I say is, are you willing to go first? As a C-suite team, are you willing to do the work first and really be with us and see change in, in real time so that it can then not only trickle down, but then you can actually have a plan of how you want to implement this in your company and share this with the rest of your company. So that's where the name C-suite comes from. And the collective part of it is all about how we are a collective of humans in the world and we can really learn to see each other and be with each other in all our differences. So even in the way that I developed a company, creating it from a place of equity and inclusion. That's awesome. I love that. Are you willing to go first? Being that, you know, we wanted to have a conversation about vulnerability and I don't even know where to start because it's a, it's a word that gets thrown around. It's a way of being that some people say, you know, they've, They've got it all. They've learned all. They've read all the books. They've watched all the documentaries. They get it. They're vulnerable. And yet I would say that more often than not, when I'm coaching CTOs or people in the C-suite, vulnerability is still something that we resist and that we avoid. What does going first look like in a C-suite when it comes to vulnerability? I think that a really good marker for people to think about when you think that you have this concept down is number one, if, you, if you're like, yeah, yeah, I understand something, anything really, but especially vulnerability, then that would be the moment to stop and pause and say, okay, wait a minute. That should tell me that I'm actually um, not getting curious in the moment about something that could be expansive for me. So the thing that I know about vulnerability is that it takes a tremendous amount of courage and emotional exposure, which never feels good to me. Okay. So when I know that I'm sweating in a meeting or I, my heart is racing because I'm trying to say something that feels very hard for me to say, that is probably me practicing in real time, uh, being vulnerable or having a moment that requires me to take some risk. So I think there's a couple ways to look at this. Number one, are you having any of those feelings, those body sensations? Do you have any moments in your day where you're slightly shaky or expansive, you know, in a conversation that you're having with your team. And if you're not, I would get curious about what you're not saying or what you're potentially soft showing in a way. Because that's another thing I think I see C-suite leaders do is that they think they're being vulnerable, but they're saying something sugar-coated or with a nice blanket wrapped around it instead of actually saying the courageous thing that might not make them the most popular person or might feel like they're exposed and people can actually come at their ideas or their thoughts. So those are just the tangible somatic ways that I, that I look at it from my body. But really, vulnerability is never going to be fun and it most likely will always be messy. So if you're in a conversation about making it a, a wrapped pretty package, then I would stop and just get curious first. Yeah. Yeah, I am currently in a vulnerability hangover, so maybe maybe yeah. I could share something. I had a I had a meeting this morning with a few developers, and I'm I'm helping a company by by CTOing some things for them. And I, <clears throat> you know, since five months ago, I had been advocating for a certain project to be executed in the company, mm -hmm. and I. I was doing that from a place of my developers are with me. We're doing this together. They understand the scope of the project. We're all on the same page. And today, a few hours before this call, before this conversation, I had a call with them because they kept raising certain questions with me that, that made me question whether they fully understood the scope of the project. And I had a moment in today's meeting where I thought, oh my goodness, they are actually not backing. They actually don't believe in the the vision that I had set for the project. Mm. And man, the, the, the thoughts that went through my brain from resentment to like, dude, what, where, where were you guys the last five months? Like I've been yeah. in the gospel of this project. And 
now when we have this check-in on the meeting, you're like, oh no, actually we, we don't really think that's really going to work. So I, I, I felt, I felt an array, array of emotions that I, I really had to manage on the call. Yeah. And my temptation was to, was to, was to sort of dig, like was to knife them. <laughs> A solid human moment. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was like, my, 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 I was, <laughs> I was ready to be like, seriously, guys, this is like, where were you? Why didn't you speak up? Why do you choose now? Like we've several iterations into this meeting, into this project and, and you're bringing this up to me now. And I had to, I, I had to st- I had to be vulnerable with them and say, hey, guys, I, I really thought we were in this together and, and forgive me if I had made assumptions. And, but I, I had such a tension inside of me of whether am I show, when I show up as vulnerable now, am I placating to them or am I weak? Am I, uh, you know, or should I be? firm and just ignore the emotions and just restate the vision and the goals and get their buy-in and move on? Or should I have a moment where there's a bit of a relational check-in? Like, hey, did I, did I overstep? Did I speak for you guys when I shouldn't have? And I, th- mm-hmm. I think sometimes I'm concerned that should one be introspective with your team and therefore be slightly more vulnerable or should one, with especially with developers who are more like, give me the scaffolding and show me where to climb and just leave me alone and I'll get there. You know, mm-hmm. should I keep reinforcing the scaffolding so they can do their job? So all that to say that right now in this moment, I, I feel like I feel a little vulnerable because the strengths that I thought that I was exuding was actually... Was was act, I didn't have my team behind me actually, and so yeah. I feel a little weird. So cool. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing all that because just even talking about it right now is a vulnerable thing, right? You're putting it on air. You're sharing with people what actually was going on inside you. That is an act of vulnerability to put it on loudspeaker right now. The second thing I want to say is what I heard you work through is all the emotions which is also part of being an emotionally aware leader. You had a variety of emotions, right? Anything between anger and upset and maybe some disappointment or fear, resignation. I don't know. We could name all the emotions that were in there. And part of being human in those moments is to feel all of those emotions. So I would say that's that's also a piece of vulnerability work is are you in touch with what's actually happening in the moment inside you? So beautiful work there. The next place I would, I would point out this conversation is exactly people do with vulnerability what you just did, which is they get vulnerable, they share what's going on, they label all their emotions, and then they go, did I do it right or was there a better way? And that's the trap in my book around vulnerability is that when we're looking at could it have gone uh, differently, or did I make a mistake? Then, then are all our judgments, right? Our judgments and our projections start to come into yeah. right. the act right. of vulnerability. Yeah, right now I need reassurance. I need to feel better about myself. I, I need, I need someone to tell me that I don't suck uh, in, yeah. as a CEO. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. So I, I feel like I'm doing a revisionist retrospective on where did I go wrong and what does it say about my abilities? And so, so it's, it's, it's a fairly complex situation that the two of you are facing right now with me in the room with you. Well, what, I think it's a beautiful situation. My, my whole keynote talk is called The Messy Middle and the Gifts of the Mess. So, you know, this is it. This is the work. And all I would say is instead of asking yourself, did I do it right or wrong? I would stop and ask yourself, did, I, did it have impact? Whatever your choice was, did it have impact? Because it sounds like even just stopping and getting back in relationship with your people provided an opening. Now they're human too. So they can do anything they want with that, right? They can say, well, yes, you should have done X, Y, Z, or 
no, you were perfect. Or I don't know, let me take a look at what I can own too in this process. There's a, a hundred different scenarios that could happen from there. But the real gift is you gave an opening because vulnerability begets vulnerability. So now you get to see what your team actually comes up with as opposed mm. to any other way of keeping all that inside of you has it go the same way, which in this scenario would be, well, I'm just going to keep saying over and over and over what I want and you're either going to get it or you're not, which, you know, leaves people behind in some sense. And it's, it's not that that way is wrong, by the way, because again, I don't want it to seem as a right or a wrong way. But it's just looking at what has the most impact and has you feeling heard and connected and your team feeling heard and connected. That's mm. what we're really after. Because then we get to have a real conversation. Like, you know, the expectations were way higher than we thought they were. Or uh, And, I, and I, think, yeah. uh, I think the, I, I love what you said. And I think the, uh, the question that comes up for me is this sort of in those moments after the vulnerable thing the moment that yeah. was sort of cracked open how do they show up as you said what you know what, what does that what does that generate for all of us still leaves me with a sort of a strain violent strain of uncertainty that i like i want to i just want to i want to feel better about myself right now and yeah <laughs> Well, and here, I can, I can have you feel better right now in the moment with us is you do exactly what you're doing now. You go talk to people who see you, right? And yeah. say, hey, that was really awesome. It was really awesome that you said that instead of doing what you might have done in your past, which is attack or blame or shame, yeah. Yeah. right? That's my go-to when I'm righteous and upset is I, I look for all the ways that I can be right about something. And that's yeah. and not a the leader I want to be. Yeah. yeah, and there was a scenario that they were that that they that they were going towards, which was an extreme, exceptional scenario, which which you know developed my my team, my people. Yes, they are rewarded for finding those needles in the haystack, but they were describing a scenario that was highly unlikely. But I think what the vulnerability produced was a empathy for that. Like instead of me being like, "You guys are crazy." Why should we spend so much time on a scenario that's most likely not going to happen? I do think that the vulnerability sort of just sort of created a bit of a empathy container for for everybody. Because I think there was a moment where they looked at me and they were like, "Oh shit, he's 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 sharing his art right now. What? How do we? What do we do with this?" Yeah, it's highly uncomfortable, right? Because most people don't do that. So that's brilliant what you created, and and I. I commend you for taking that route because I want to speak to one other piece that you keep mentioning. It's the after effect. And this is another measurement for whether or not you're actually being vulnerable in a room. Again, it's not going to feel good. It's going to feel like you just released a whole bunch of energy or emotion. Or sometimes when I say something really vulnerable and I take a big risk and then either it goes well or it doesn't, my whole body relaxes all that energy I was holding and I feel like I've worked out for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So there is some, some very physical sensations and also your brain is recalibrating in real time what just happened. So there is an after effect, which could be another marker for you to say, was mm. I actually practicing vulnerability or was I not? Mm. Wow. It also sounds like, you know, if we're relating to a vulnerable experience as often causing body sensations and, and our, our, may, our mind, you know, racing, that it would make sense that we would want to do the thing we know to do to leave the vulnerability, which feels like a, did I do it right conversation? That is a much more logical, I mean, can I look at this logically? Can I see if I did it right? So what I also hear in this conversation is that can we actually be in the vulnerability longer by not rating ourselves or not judging ourselves by how it went? And then not only is it an impact question in terms of our team, right? What's the impact on our team of our vulnerability? But what's the impact on me that I'm allowing myself the space to have just been vulnerable and not needing to judge it or evaluate it? That is so good. I think that's exactly what I am stuck in is, is did I do it right? Or, or is the impact going to be right? Or did I irreparably damage my reputation with them, which is even worse for my ego because I want them to think I'm perfect? Yeah. I am, I am by the way. 
Yeah. And that's such a human thing, right? That that's what we want. We want that validation. And even on the back end, what we're really talking about, if we want to go deep and get vulnerable for a second, is there would have been a bigger cost to your soul to not say those things and to keep them inside, right? So then it becomes a conversation about are you actually honoring you and your value system as a leader? Or wow. are we keeping ourselves from, from being true and authentic to who we are? And I, th I think this is so powerful, especially, Britt, when you said, what is the impact on me? I, I think if I can find fulfillment and, and, and gratitude and just completeness in knowing that I was genuinely true to my own concerns in that meeting, hmm. that my display of vulnerability was truly authentic. It was scary and it, there was some uncertainty. There wasn't uncertainty in there. But if I can find fulfillment in that, then I, yeah, then I think I would be less concerned with what do people think of me right now or did I do it right or what is the future impact on future generations of humans? Yeah, so I, I think that's that's huge. Thank you. I think the call, I think we're good. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so fun. I want to talk a little bit about this as it applies to our peer groups, being that mm -hmm. some of the people who listen are already in some of our forums and maybe people aren't, but they've heard about it, you know, where we, we get groups of people together who meet with the same people every month. And I suspect that there is a level of, well, it's kind of like the place where we say, hey, this is the place you can come practice vulnerability because it's not mm -hmm. with your C-suite. It's not with your CEO. It's with other CTOs of other companies. So this is the place to really practice. And I would suspect that still there's a resistance to it. Yet I know that all of these folks really do want to practice. So I'm just curious, like, what does it look like to practice vulnerability for for the practice. Yeah, it's, well, I think that it's a beautiful thing to have a container to practice in. So first of all, I just, again, it's beautiful what you all have created to allow spaces to have that happen. And remember that any containers that are created need some guidelines and some, some rules and some boundaries with each other. So I think one of the things you could look at immediately with, with these groups is what are what are the rules in these spaces when you're practicing and do, does everybody opt into them and are we really opting in or are there some people that are not okay with those rules and they don't feel safe so we can't ever guarantee safety in a room but we can practice brave spaces and i love this distinction the difference between safety and bravery in a place to practice vulnerability because it's sometimes it's really messy when you're being brave you might say something that hurts or has impact for someone, and then you need to be able to be with it and clean it up. And then, again, that's the mess. So I think that if you all have an agreement that you're willing to be generous with each other and clean up anything that comes up, if it does come up, that is a beautiful container to step into. And then I would really say, you know, like in real time, this could look like something like, hey, Brittany, I want to share something really vulnerable with you that I can't say with my company and this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling like as a biracial woman in the C-suite, I'm still not being heard. And I know that I need to walk into that room and say something and I feel like I'm not safe and I'm going to be attacked every time I do it. So I, I need to say that here because I know you can hold it and you see me and I need to practice saying it here so that I can say it 20 times here so that I can get up enough courage to go and say it one time in that room. And I also need some support yeah. in knowing that I'm not going to, you know, fall over and die if I do get attacked in that room. Yeah, and, I, and I, think, I think that is such a missed opportunity so many times is the preface. Often when I talk to my wife or when we're in a heated moment, we will, I will say something that if I had just prefaced it with, I am feeling this right now, and so I, or I, I need to be vulnerable right now. I think we jump, mm -hmm. we jump to the execution of the thing when we have such a great opportunity, especially in our forums or even with our business partners and C-suites to say, Hey, I just want to say, I'm hearing this. I feel the certain thing. 
So I might say something now that is going to sound A, B, or C, and then to say the thing. I, 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 I wish mm -hmm. oftentimes that I would just have that sort of moment where I could give myself a break and, and just say, mm. I don't have to perform my response. I can first qualify my response and then do the response. Is that, does that sound right or wrong? Well, I'm not going to tell you if it's right or wrong. <laughs> but it sounds really, you know, like a really lovely partnership move. You know, I think of Aaron and myself, you know, my partner, Etienne, you made me think of how there's been moments of miscommunication between us that are normal, normal miscommunications in any couple, right? And what I notice is he might share something that he, he is, is very hard for him to share. And I don't actually know that that's hard for him to share. And so sometimes he'll say, hey, this is very vulnerable for me and this is hard for me to say. And then all of a sudden, my ears are listening different because I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, okay, he's, he's, he's alerting me that there's something coming versus, you know, the, there's a couple things that in our relationship of seven years that I now know when he says, hey, that really hurt or I'm feeling really attacked right now or I'm feeling like you can't hear me. I've learned to listen differently, but we had to do that intermediate step to get there. First, I didn't always listen to that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. to because I I I can't actually feel what he's feeling unless he lets me in, and vice versa. Yeah. And he's much better at it than I am, so <laughs> I have a lot more practicing to do. No, I think I think that this is hard for me to say. I can totally see how that opens up the way for vulnerable being vulnerable. I, I have a question around just the canonical definition of vulnerability. I know earlier before this we hit record. We, we, you know, we said that we talk about vulnerability a lot, especially at seven CTOs as well. And I know this is sort of at the cornerstone of some of the work you do. So just for our audience out there, how, what is vulnerability? When, when do you see it? And, and just, just give us a little bit of that. Sure. I like to use Brene Brown's definition here because it really resonates with me. There are a couple of definitions of vulnerability out there, but I really love hers and she says the definition of vulnerability is uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. That vulnerability is not weakness, but our most accurate measure of courage. So I like those three pieces together, uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, because those to me are the three ingredients that really create that sensation that I was talking about at the beginning of the call. So that's, that's the definition I most align with. I love it. And if I think of just the nature of technology development, we are wired to, to mitigate, eradicate uncertainty, yes. mitigate risk, and to be cold-hearted robots when it comes to, no, I'm kidding, but emotional, the emotional exposure just by definition sounds super damn scary. Yeah. And look, I really have a lot of respect for CTOs in the world because this is at odds with what you do. And Brene really makes a very clear distinction. So for any of you all that are confused about this, I highly recommend you go and read um, her chapter specifically around the myths of vulnerability because she speaks to systemic vulnerability and this exact thing, which is where you all live, right? You eat, sleep, and breathe here. And the difference that she's talking about is that we don't want systems that are, that are vulnerable. Of course, none of us want that. I don't want an airplane that breaks down and can't fly in the sky when I'm in it, right? But we do want humans that are producing these systems to be vulnerable. Because the idea is that if as a human, you are creating deeper connections and belonging and intimacy with other humans that you're working with, you're actually going to create a pretty dynamic system that might not have been possible if you didn't have those connections from a human perspective. So I do think it's worth really thinking about that as CTOs because nobody's asking you to make the systems weak or exposed or um, in any different way than you're already making them other than to add in this aspect of human connection, which drives culture and belonging and innovation. Mm, so good. So on the, I'm tempted to ask you about the myths of vulnerability. Uh, so... The first myth that she talks about is that vulnerability is weakness. So, look, you mentioned this before. 
Etienne, right? Like this is this is a cultural, a culturally taught myth that the idea is that if you expose yourself, you are weak. Now, in some instances, you're correct because we just said emotional exposure and risk, right? So that in by some definitions, that does mean you're weak. But really what we mean here is that when you're taught from a very young age that you are weak if you show emotion or you're weak if you let your guard down, then it creates a sense of armor and protection that keeps people out. And I don't know about you all, but growing up, a lot of the men in my family were taught that if they were fully expressed or emotional, that was that was very weak. And got to tell you, that didn't go so well for relationships for them, both business and personal, right? In, until they learned to be more expressed and more open. I hear the first one, what it makes me think about is how myth, in general, in the world, not just around vulnerability, but myths are typically designed to protect us from something or keep something out or keep something in. And it's really interesting to to really ask yourself kind of to the question Elena asked earlier to Etienne of what is my experience of this or what am I getting of, hey, is this actually what I want to protect myself from? Or is this a learned thing that I feel like I need to protect myself from? So I don't know about you all, but I'm going to continue to listen to the rest of the myths through that lens of what does that myth protect us from? Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it for sure. The second one that she talks about is I don't do vulnerability. So this is this is another cultural lens of I just don't do it. Like I don't have to. I shouldn't. I I. I've never experienced it in my life. And the reason that we call it a myth is because there are places that you have been vulnerable in your life and you may not have known it or you didn't call it vulnerability or you didn't label it that way. So it's just an opportunity to take a look where you're stuck in the conversation. I remember I was training in a room a couple of years ago and there was one woman in the room that was like, I've never, uh, I've never experienced shame and I don't do vulnerability. And I thought, wow, you must like, okay, tell me about that life because I don't know one human on the planet planet that has experienced that that is, you know, not a psychopath, which is what Brene says. Like if you don't experience shame, then then that's a psychopathic tendency. And when we got in there and we did some work, she started to realize that she just didn't have the language around it and that she had experienced those things. Number three is I, I can go it alone. So this is very common in leaders, right? I've got it handled. I can do this myself especially new leaders who only have one way of leading. So when they start to work with other CTOs that start to work with the rest of their teams and their way used to work, and as long as they have a bunch of people just like them, it works. Mm. But if they get other people that are not like them, it doesn't work. <laughs> right? So this idea that I can do this alone and I don't need anybody comes from really a place of fear and control versus, oh, I might actually have to be vulnerable in this moment and say, I don't actually understand how you work. Can you tell me more about that? Because my style of work is different than yours. Yeah, and I think that's a go-to strategy uh, for that kind of difference or, or spotting that kind of diversity in your teams is that I need to, I know I have this tendency to say, okay, the, the idea of facing into the conversations I should be having is so much more scary than to just cut these people off or make some severe changes. So I'm just going to opt for the former. I mean, the latter. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's very interesting. I know going it alone is definitely a survival mechanism for me. So yeah. I definitely relate to that. Yeah. And a lot of people that are independent and, you know, can ha have a high capacity of what they can be with or take on. This is everyday life for them. So the, the challenge is really to ask yourself, what could change in your life or what could you experience differently in your work life as well if you didn't have it all handled and you could vulnerably trust other people to, mm. to have your back? The fourth myth we've already talked about, and it's you can engineer the uncertainty and risk out of relational vulnerability the same way you engineer it out of systemic vulnerability. So really just what I explained before, that humans are humans and systems are meant to still be safe. So we're not asking you to do the same thing to systems that we are to yourself and humans. Mm -hmm. 
Myth number five, trust comes before vulnerability. This is a big one. This is the biggest misconception that I find when I'm working with leaders is that they think that they have to trust someone to be vulnerable. They actually exist in tandem. So you got to be vulnerable to trust and you got to trust to be vulnerable. So there is no, it's like the chicken and the egg conversation. It's working together. And sometimes it will be very high risk and exposure to be the one to go first, even if there is no trust built. So this one, this myth just exists to remind you that you don't need trust to practice and lean in. That feels unfathomable. I know. I know. It's risky, right? And it's dangerous, which again, in a container that you've created safe and in places that you feel safe enough to try this, this would be a place to try it without trust being built. So walking into a room full of leaders at a conference and saying, I believe vulnerability is important. I don't know that I don't trust these people. I don't know that they they are going to come at me and tell me all about how vulnerability is not true. But that is a vulnerable move to walk into a room and say my beliefs. That's so very clearly. interesting. Yes, very interesting. I can, I can see how I've seen vulnerability between strangers and clearly no, not enough time to build trust. Huh, that is, that's a big one. Because that, I think that's also a very comfortable security blanket to say, well, I can't be vulnerable because I don't really trust. You know, that's, I'm, I'm realizing now that that's, That is a bit of a scapegoat. Mm -hmm. It lets people off the hook. It's back to the conversation, Brittany, that you brought around. Like, I'm good. I know vulnerability. I'm good. It's the same. It lives in the same wheelhouse (laughs) over there. Yeah, Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. What I'm really hearing from this conversation differently than I have before is that to avoid vulnerability or resist it is an attempt to mitigate something. And really like what a leader could do from this podcast is look at what is the thing I keep trying to mitigate and what is the impact of me trying to Mm. mitigate that thing or ensure that it doesn't happen or lessen it. And as a great reminder over and over again, it just and similar to the definition that Brene Brown gives is vulnerability is truly a human experience. And we so want to ensure that we have something other than a human experience. We want to have the right experience. We want to have the experience we should have. We want to be the leader that we read about in a book versus like the version of us that we don't know very well because that's scary. Gosh, don't put me in a room and make me be myself. I don't know that person well enough. I just know the version of her or him or they that I'm supposed to be. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's like that's my, so good. My, my coach will say to me, what does, what does being this way help you being right, be right about, you know, I mean, it's a bit of a mm-hmm. different, different way to put that. If I act this way, then I get to be right about what, you know? Myth number six, vulnerability is disclosure. So this is really important because I think that to end our conversation, a lot of people are afraid of being vulnerable because they think that they need to share everything in their life to be vulnerable. And notice with some of the examples we gave today that it wasn't oversharing. So this isn't walking into a room and crying nonstop for hours about your life or things that are happening. And if you feel like you need that, then please, you know, create spaces where you can do that with your therapist or your friends or even people at work if they're willing to hold that for you. But the difference is, is that's not actually vulnerable. That is Mm. you getting a need met. Mm. And vulnerability, again, remember, takes some risk and emotional exposure and some uncertainty. You don't know what you're going to get from that person. And so I think people often confuse that you need to disclose everything to be vulnerable versus what is what is really the hard thing that you want to say. So that's just one that I think is really important to know. Yeah. So folks know, you know, Elena, why we're even talking about Brene Brown is that you are a dare to lead facilitator and trainer. So what would you say maybe the seventh myth is or the seventh thing you would want to say about vulnerability in all your expertise in this? Maybe another myth that I would add in or create myself would be that you have to be vulnerable all the time to have impact. That's not true either, right? So I think a lot of people think that the name of the game for being a great leader is to be vulnerable and emotional all the time. And I, and I think that's I think that's a myth because no, no person can do that 100% of the time, all day long. 
and you have to, you know, refill your gas tank, just like Etienne, you have to do after you've practiced something hard. And so remember that you're going to have very human moments too. And so you can pick and choose when you want to be vulnerable and when you don't. It can actually just mm. be a choice instead of there's only one right way to be a leader. Yes. And and this just does, I quickly want to ask this before we say goodbye. What If you're on the receiving end of someone's vulnerability, what what is the best way to be? He wants to know how to get it right. How to don't get it right. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there's a best way to be, but I, what I what I like when I'm being vulnerable and uh, someone, you know, someone responds to me is just some gratitude. It feels really good to be heard and to just mm. say, like, have the receiving person say, "Wow, that sounded really hard to say. Thank you for saying it." Yes. Like just a simple piece of acknowledgement that it was heard and received is yeah. like makes it worth it something something that the developers in today's meeting did not give me well you know like i said we can't expect it (laughs) but but we can give it to you (laughs) now this was amazing i this was really awesome as i mentioned we were in your workshop fantastic work i great Mm -hmm. respect for you and the work you're doing and the c-suite collective so Thank you. I'm very happy Brooke got you for us. So thank you for joining us and spending time with us. Thank you so much to you both. Thank you for the work you're doing.